so much for a fantastic presentation, which, and your work has added so much to the increasingly strong body of um, knowledge and the evidence that we now have that intervening early is the best way to prevent violence. Um, I'm, the thoughts of a friendly colleague of mine, David Stone, an epidemiologist in Glasgow, are that um, we're now in a situation rather analogous to the situation in public health in the early 19th century where we had a, a worsening uh, public health and um, the beginnings of <coughs> inquiry and the development of public health initiatives and vaccines and we're actually at this stage now and we're just beginning to think about how we make things uh, better for uh, the youngest children. For, from my perspective the key question is how do we actually get this knowledge into a system of support for parents to uh, provide uh, what uh, their young children need to prevent them following a, a, a trajectory of violence and uh, that has a number of dimensions. The first is how early can we identify the children at highest risk? Um, we've made a number of attempts at a policy level to try to intervene. For one example that's just about to start, for example, is the nurse family partnership or family nurse partnership, depending on which side of the Atlantic you come from, uh, pilots in, in Lothian, which is just about to start. And it's, it's targeted at the children of um, uh, teenage mothers and uh, it's expensive and it's going to run for a little while and we may or may not find out whether it works or not. But um, it's, it's targeted at the children of teenage mothers. Now, most of those children are actually going to be okay. Um, and as a corollary to that, many children who are not the children of teenage mothers are not going to be okay. Um, we have some information, we have the information that you're producing in your cohorts. We've got information from uh, Lynn Murray, for example, uh, who shows that emotional and behavioural dysregulation at eight months is a, is a reasonably good predictor of conduct disorder at eight years. Um, we've got uh, other evidence. We've got the genetic work by Ashlam Caspi and Terry, Mor Terry Moffat and so on, which helps us to piece together a jigsaw of children of the profile of a child who is at the highest risk of, of following a violent trajectory. Um, I still think we need more work, we need, we need more birth cohorts which are looking much more intensively at the development of children and, and uh, to try and find identifiers um, of, which we can use in a practical clinical sense in order to identify which children are at highest risk and to put the resources into, into those children. Um, the Nurse Family Partnership, as I say, is an expensive intervention and we need to get it, it's not sustainable for every child in, in Scotland, and how do we get it to the right children? As a, an additional component of, of developing a proper service, as well as having the capacity for inquiry, for understanding how, which children are at highest risk, is how do we get the services, how, what systems do we put in place to identify those children? Here's where primary care comes in. We've got a very good system of primary care in Scotland. Um, we've got general practice, which is that's where I'm coming from, and we've got health visitors, who are the only professionals who are in universal contact with every child in the country. And I think we need to be um, thinking about how we give general practitioners and health visitors the skills to identify children. Now, we're not going to expect general practitioners, certainly, to be involved in delivering therapy, uh, health visitors might be able to deliver some low-level interventions, but how do we identify children and how do we engage primary care with this kind of work? I think that's a very crucial, uh, very crucial issue and one which needs uh, um, a lot of work. We're beginning to do some work in, in Glasgow looking at uh, actually collecting at a population level data on child development, on uh, teaching health visitors to evaluate the parent-child interaction, uh, asking parents about problem behaviours when their children are two and a half years old. Um, we need to think about language development, which is, uh, is intertwined with the development of, of, uh, um, of aggression in children. Children who can't express themselves may not be able to express themselves because their parents have never spoken to them, um, but actually um, they're much more likely to uh, express their frustration uh, through violence than, uh, than through language. 
Um, so we need to have systems for collecting data at population level. In my view, we need to upskill the primary care teams, who are the only ones who are working with all under threes, and we need to have uh, a much greater knowledge uh, of the trajectories, and that means birth cohorts with detailed evaluations. Uh, in my view. Thank you. Thanks very much, Phil. Before you respond to that, can I ask Peter to give some observations to you? Sure. Um, Sorry, Peter. Peter is, is from the very well-known to you. He's currently a Professor of Public Health at St Andrews University and Lead Public Health Medicine Research and Teacher Teaching at Butte Medical School. His key research areas currently are violence and violence reduction and works closely with John Pekong as well. Sally, thanks. Um, well, Richard, that was a great lecture. Um, and, you know, so thank you for that and thank you to to Sally and John in his absence for having the foresight to, to bring Richard across to talk to us. My head is spinning with ideas, actually, as a result of that, but let me just discipline myself to make a few principal points. Um, the first thing I thought as I was satting, sitting there was that sometimes um, the most important insights in science are obvious, but only in retrospect. And I think the insight that perhaps all of us are born with a propensity to assertiveness, to aggression, to violence, and then learn not to use it, is actually very important. Uh, so when Newton was lying under the tree and the apple hit him on the head, <coughs> it's pretty damn obvious to us that gravity is necessary to explain that but only in retrospect, until Newton spent a lifetime working it out and articulating it. And actually what we've heard from Richard is a lifetime body of work, I thought, very eloquently and very modestly presented, actually. Uh, it's only when you have the insight and then back it with that body of work that in retrospect it seems very obvious uh, the second thing was that uh, before moving to St Andrews to set up a research group in the field of violence prevention, I was very privileged to spend five years working in government with uh, Pam Whittle, who I'm delighted to see in the audience, and the Chief Medical Officer, Harry Burns. And one of the things that used to occupy the minds of the three of us quite a lot was how we brought together social and biological explanations of health inequalities and Harry does a great talk on it and when I hear Richard speak I can kind of begin to see how all of the pieces of the jigsaw should, could come together how social and biological explanations of the origins of health inequalities are not really in competition they're simply a different way of looking at the same problems The third thought I had was that the areas of our society that suffer health inequalities tend to suffer all of the issues that Richard uh, referred to in his talk. So the same areas that suffer very premature death from ischemic heart disease, that have high levels of cancer, that have problems with teenage pregnancy, that have low immunization rates, etc., etc., it's all the same areas. What struck me listening, though, to the talk is that often the first visible manifestations of health inequality in these communities are two things. It's violence amongst young males and it's teenage pregnancy. Of course, if you look at the stats, you can see all sorts of health inequalities earlier. For example, in terms of differential infant mortality rates, differential uptake of immunizations, etc., but the first thing that are really visible often to communities are interpersonal violence among males and teenage pregnancy. And what I was hearing articulated was a potentially very important relationship between those two things. Because the young girls who young men are making pregnant at the age of 15 and 16 and who have to face the impossibly difficult task 
of lone parenting of potentially giving rise to the next generation of violent young men and women who themselves may go on to childbear at a very early age. And whilst that's a very challenging thought, I think it actually shows us a potential way forward into this as well. Because it does seem like there is some evidence that intervening around parenting actually can have considerable benefit. My final thought, Richard, just relates your work to the work that uh, I've become very interested in in recent years, which is that which is published by Vincent Felitti and his uh, co-researcher in the States, uh, Alta. Uh, it's a joint study uh, that's gone on, on over many years between the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta and Kaiser Permanente in California. And essentially it relates adverse childhood experience effectively child neglect and child abuse in all its various manifestations to adult ill health. And all of the things that you listed on the right side of one of your slides there in terms of adverse outcomes are also things that they can correlate to child neglect and child abuse. And what's interesting to me is the way these various pieces of research are beginning to come together, beginning to fill out the picture and beginning to give us, I think, clear ideas of where not just research, but interventions should take place. So thank you for a wonderful lecture. And finally, I'd like to ask John Harkin um, to respond. John is a, member, a senior police officer of the Strathclyde Police Force and is currently heading up the Violence Reduction Unit. This was set up in 2005 to work on long-term solutions for tackling violent crime in Scotland. But one of the things that I think marks John out for many people is his passionate advocacy of intervention in the early years. Thanks. Thanks, thanks very much, and thanks for the invite along. It was um, a, a, an excellent uh, lecture. I, I, I won't confess to capture all of it, but, but um, the things that are, that are there, that recognise lots of things that are there. I think sometimes perhaps I, I get brought along to these events to keep the average IQ down, but, but um, <laughs> so I'll try and take a, 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 as, as pragmatic a view as I can about this and, and to try and land it um, to something that perhaps would make a difference. I, I've known for some time, I think, that lots of, like lots of other people, that violence is a, an absolutely wicked problem. And we're dealing with a new reality. We're dealing with the reality of a change in society and we're dealing with the reality of a science that's catching up with that and, and, and trying to make sense of things for us, which is the right thing to do. Um, from our end of the business, after the point of impact, after the violence, um, like uh, A&E uh, uh, professionals, we, we're dealing with the outcomes from these sort of things. And therefore, we perhaps have the greatest uh, desire uh, to get something done now about it. Um, and so we shouldn't, in saying that, lose sight of that evidence that's at the early years and we should be moving up there upstream as fast as we possibly can. But I think if we start to frame some of the problems and challenges that we have in 21st century Scotland and indeed 21st century UK, if we frame them all in the same way, we would arrive with lots of similar conclusions. Um, and one of the things that concerns me sometimes is that when, when we have really complex and complicated problems and we have really, really clever people having a look at them, we, we tend to start searching around for really complex and complicated solutions. And I think we know enough to be doing something. We know enough about who's most at risk. We know enough about how we might reduce that risk. And I think the challenge for us is to line up the policy machine that's there to make sure that we have services that suit the problems of the 21st century because the services we have are 20th century services. And if we were starting with a blank sheet of paper, we wouldn't actually design them the way they are right now. And the territorialism that's a challenge for us in the west of Scotland with gangs is a challenge for the rest of us because the territorialism between education and health and social services and local politicians and national politicians is a really chronic issue. 
And I think the role that, the role that science and scientists and the people that are at the top table, with, excluding myself and many in this room have, is to start to give politicians and policy makers the confidence to do the right thing. And that's about clear, consistent messages. It's not about different researchers saying we need a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that. Yes, we do, and that's fine. Let's not tell the politicians that. Let's tell the politicians what we can be getting on with right now. Because I think we are and we have enough knowledge to be doing some things and not sitting back and waiting. If we always wait until we, we would be nowhere. So, first of all, let's do no harm. But let's be confident enough to aspire, encourage more research, encourage more scientists to apply themselves to this, listen to what they say, put into practice what they suggest, and evaluate what we can do. And then once it works, scale it up and let's do it. It's going to take some time, but I think we need to make a start. So I, I think there's a, an impetus in Scotland right now. We're not quite at that tipping point yet, but I, I think there is a gathering notion that we're looking in the right direction. But let's you know, keep looking for something and chasing that holy grail. Sometimes, as I say, the simple solutions are there. Parents at risk, let's give them a hand. Thanks very much. We've had some very um, eloquent um, responses to Richard. I think that has been excellent. We, we, we have probably about 10, 15 minutes left. Do you want to just respond um, how you want in a, in a minute to what's been said here and then we'll throw it open to the floor? Okay. Um, <clears throat> A number of ideas came to my mind in hearing your, your comments. Um, and I guess the way I can summarize this is that um, I'll tell you a, a story about convincing politicians. Um, but ten years ago, the Minister for Youth in the province of Quebec, by chance read something that was written about my work. And he invited me to meet him and asked me, what do we, what should we do? And he was just coming in as a minister. He wanted to change things. He had um, real drive. And I explained to him, you know, it's it's simple. The way you are spending your money is that you spend very little money when the child is young and the older he grows and the more trouble he makes, the more money you spend on him. So the chap who has the, is the worst will get the most by the time he's 18 years of age. It costs $100,000 to keep one of these persons in residential treatment. And what you should do, minister, is the reverse. You put more money at the start, and as you go, you put less and less. If it hasn't worked at the start, it's no use continuing to put a lot of money in this thing. And he looked at me and said, oh, that's easy. <laughs> that I can sell. And he went away, convinced the prime minister. And um, we, we rapidly calculated how much it would cost. And, and the idea was interventions for every adolescent mother in the province, we calculated that it would cost something like a hundred million dollars or something like that. And he went to the prime minister and he got 25 million a year added budget to start doing this. And he asked me to help implement this thing. And you know what happened? The 25 million dollars. There were, um, you told me there are 14 health areas. In the province of Quebec, there's about 14 health areas also. 
they started fighting for the 25 million. And so the minister disappeared by the time uh, the, the money was there to be given. And the decision, and I sat with, with the people who were doing this, the, the, res, the people responsible for each region, it was obvious that if you spread the 25 million around to everybody, you don't have enough money to, to do the job. The person needs a whole aspirin and you're going to give that person a quarter of an aspirin? You're wasting your money on doing not enough. And, and so we're 10 years later and the 25 million is still there. They never got more money. The, there was no assessment of what's going on and everybody is happy that they got the Tremblay $25 million <laughs> spread around to every. So there is a, even when, once you've convinced the politicians, there is a problem of how we use our resources. And we, I think there is enough evidence to show that the money that you have, you need to use it with the most at risk and you need to give them everything that they need. And if you don't give everything that you need, you're wasting the money. It's as simple as that. There's no way that solving these problems will be cheap. It's expensive. But we are already spending the money. We're spending the money because we are trying too late to solve the problem. Thank you very much. Could I throw it open to the floor now for questions and comments? We have a roving mic. If you could, um, the gentleman at the front here, if you could give your name and where you're from before you ask the question. Yes. Hello, I'm Jonathan Shear from Children in Scotland. Um, I learned a lot, and it was a wonderful talk. Thank you for sharing it with us. I want to limit myself to one point, which is that there is something simple that we know about, and unfortunately it hasn't been mentioned, so it's left to me to mention it, which is that one of the causes that we can do something about that is simple and early is to prevent fetal alcohol harm. Um, not every woman who drinks during pregnancy gives birth to a, a child who's harmed by alcohol. We don't have the science to predict who will and who won't and which babies will and won't be harmed. But we do know that there is a very large number of children, not just the deep end of fetal alcohol syndrome where you can see it in their face, but the far vaster number of children whose brain development has been harmed by fetal alcohol exposure. And in essence, what it does, as you would know, is it, it as a teratogenic agent, it changes the development of the brain so that it doesn't develop properly. It primarily affects the executive functions of the brain, which boils down to the ability to plan. There are no fetally harmed, fetal alcohol harmed criminal masterminds. Planning isn't what they can do. Second thing that it does is it, it um, stops people from learning from experience. So the, you talked about how they're not learning to control behavior. They're not learning. That's absolutely characteristic of fetal alcohol harm, is to not learn from experience. And the third part of executive function is the inability to control impulses. Not the unwillingness, the inability. And so if children's brains are harmed before they ever draw their first breath, 
by fetal alcohol exposure, the problems that you've identified are, are obvious consequences of it. We just don't pay attention to it, and we don't do what we can to prevent it. Um, just a, a comment on, uh, on that. Um, we measured alcohol consumption during pregnancy, and, and we measured um, smoking uh, during pregnancy. The reason I didn't mention alcohol is because when you do the analyses, we're looking at a random sample of the population, the mothers who drink too much also smoke. And the smoking does the same thing as the alcohol. And these are clearly epigenetic effects. It's the, the effect on executive function is an effect on brain development through epigenetic effects, huh? gene expression. Um, and there are much more women who smoke during pregnancy than there are that drink too much during pregnancy. So in these analyses, what comes out is the smoking behavior, but it covers the alcohol uh, consumption. Thanks so much. So another question. The lady in blue at the front, and then there's two more over here. I thought it was incredibly interesting. It was really, really good. And clearly we have this um, remit to work with very young boys and with women who fill the profile of women who are likely to be the mothers of violent young boys. I think the thing that I really look forward to there is to seeing the research on the characteristics of the girls, the young girls, who then become the adolescents who don't have the educational attainment, which was obviously clearly correlated with having sons who went on to be violent um, and to becoming mothers very, very young. Because it feels like that's such a big piece of the jigsaw that's hugely missing, that we now run the risk of spending a lot of money um, targeting adolescent girls in a way that we have been targeting violent adolescent boys because they're troubled and troubling as well and I just really look forward to the research on girls and I was wondering how that was progressing at this stage Well we are um, the only study where we looked only at males was the, the first study that we did the, the other study um, where we started uh, at birth, and um, the twin study, we have girls and, uh, and boys, and it's the story is the same, except that the girls who have these aggression problems early on, they learn more quickly not to use physical aggression because they're not physically built to survive with physical aggression. Um, they use more indirect aggression. Um, they, they are failing in school um, very early on. They are hyperactive. They become depressive. So the, the profile during adolescence is depression um, and it's failure in school. And so if you're a girl and you're failing in school and you feel lousy, the only issue in life is to become a mother. And you become quickly a mother with one of these males. And so this intergenerational reproduction um, is very clear that the, the best predictor of success in school in children from all the studies is your mother's education. And so we clearly need to put a lot of resources in helping young girls succeed, succeed in school. And we know the predictors 
of young girls not succeeding in school. It's the mothers that did not succeed. And, and so this, it, there is that fight between early intervention and late, later intervention. There, there is that. And I've come to realize that it doesn't make sense. The only way we can intervene early with children is by helping their parents. And helping their parents mean a late intervention with individuals who have a history of, of problems. But the target with young children, the, the priority is the mother. Because the mother is the one who is carrying the baby. The, 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 the biological view of it is that the biggest damage that we're doing to children is in utero. It's alcohol, it's smoking, it's stress, it's the bad eating, it's the violence around them. All these things are affecting the development of that brain in utero and then we're trying to catch up. So, so that's why interventions with young pregnant women and, and my, what I was saying to the minister, it's not the young pregnant woman who's had three, four children. Start with the young pregnant woman who's at her first pregnancy. You, you catch the young woman when she starts having children and you help her having less children, separating. So, so the nurse home visitation partnership is, it's very hard to imagine that there's something better than that. It's costly, but it's much less costly than a hundred thousand dollars for someone who is in a residential treatment in, in, in adolescence. I, I think we have, we're running over slightly. Um, I think we have time for one more question and then we can adjourn for some refreshments and more conversation. So the lady yeah. in blue. Okay, I'd just like to say thanks very much to everyone actually and I think everyone here is singing from the same song sheet and saying if you go back to, for the adolescent girls they probably came from these kind of families and so on and so forth and I just can totally understand your frustration and people like Dr. Bruce Perry and Ghost in the Nurse I kind of feel all this research has been out there for 10 years at the very least saying you know if we don't get it right in our early childhood we're getting it wrong and it's going to be hugely hugely expensive so the frustration is continuing because it's still not shaping policy or if it's starting to shape policy because it is actually in things like curriculum for excellence and all these kind of things but it's still not the, the money is not coming in behind it like you say and one of the reasons maybe the money's not coming in behind it is public perception and I mean, one of the things that we do as part of the project that we're doing is training staff, training parents, training carers, not necessarily the really vulnerable and targeted you know, individuals, but the ones that are going to be on the sort of minister's back going, why are we spending, you know, 400 million on these babies that aren't causing us any problem and not dealing with, as you were saying, you know, this one individual that's... Um, beaten up their neighbour. So I wonder, really, is how can research be doing? We're doing our bit, you know, with trying to get the word out, but how can research influence the media in order to influence the general public that this is actually where we should be spending our money? Okay. I have had one desperate plea from a lady in the up there, and I'm afraid we, we, must, we must let her ask the question. Thanks very much. Um, just very briefly, I'm Leslie Johnston from the Gender-Based Violence Team with the Scottish Government. Um, I think it's been very interesting hearing the discussion tonight, but I think one missing factor is the fact that um, these girls that you're talking about, these very vulnerable teenage girls, have actually been exposed to very high levels of violence themselves, perhaps as children in terms of adult survivors, child sexual abuse, and also in terms of violence from their partners. Um, I think that's possibly part of the missing equation here as we're talking about the actual presence of an abusive partner and the impact that that has on the mother's health and well-being and clearly on the child's health and well-being. Um, and certainly within our team, it's one of the um, interventions which we're developing along with the health service is to actually start 
routine inquiry and to start routinely asking pregnant women because we know there's a very high prevalence in terms of the escalation of violence and very often violence will start during a pregnancy. And, and I think, you know, if I could perhaps leave that point that I think there's lots of things we can be doing that don't necessarily cost a lot of money. It's in terms of asking the right question, risk assessment, safety planning and supporting women who are in these very difficult situations. Yeah. Okay, um, well, thank you so much for uh, a positively stimulating evening. Um, I'd like to thank Richard very much um, for, for his presentation. I'd like to thank our panel members for their very astute observations. I'd like to thank particularly Sam Bain, who has been beavering away over the last few weeks. Sam, can you wave your hand? I don't know if I'm to. Where are you, sir? Hi, sir. Thanks so much for the effort you put into organising this, and also Karen and Reese, who's on holiday at the moment. Um, but finally, I'd really like to thank the audience, because I think your participation has been, been great. Um, I'm sorry we haven't had time for more questions. I'd like to leave you with one thought. I think there really is a very big challenge here. We've identified an enormous issue, a very important problem. And I think the challenge for government, tell you very much what our, our colleague from Scottish Government said about there is a lot you can do with relatively small resources. But it does seem to me there is a need to redirect substantial amounts of funding in a targeted way to provide sufficient support for this particular group. And I'd like to leave you that thought. Thanks very much to everyone for coming. And, uh,